So I'm ready to invite uh, Mr. Ganesh Pandey. Ganesh Pandey is the CEO of uh, Plus Power Systems. And uh, um, I think Harish has sent a brief, brief profile of, uh, of him. And relatively with the background, he is an engineer, electrical engineer uh, with a master's from the US. And uh, he was working in the US for a few years. And then that's when he decided to move back. It's a story that resonates with some of us here because our overall South side came back. So that's one thing that we can connect with. Um, after coming back, he uh, founded HPS in 2007, and uh, over the last four years, the company has grown and we talk about the most big, that's one of the things that we talk about today. Um, and the whole idea of, uh, of uh, HPS, plus power systems, I mean, if you call it HPS, is, uh, is that you don't have to have the energy or a non-profit to work in the base of development, what we call it. So you can make money, you can be profitable, and that's the idea of uh, that's the theme of uh, as power systems. When we talk about we talk about how that all works. So that's um, about uh, a little bit of background. And um, personally, I've worked with him for So I can just tell you that he's a very dynamic person. He has uh, obviously he has a social brand. That's why he's doing power systems. But more importantly, he has a sharp, very really sharp business mind. And that's something that we all know that is very important to especially when you're working in so with that, uh, again, welcome Yanesh and uh, we look forward to it. Uh -huh. uh, thank you and good afternoon. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, before I go further, let me tell you I'm not a businessman. I've never felt like a businessman. So I wouldn't be, I've never had any formal business education and uh, so I will be talking more from a very experiential and commonsensical point of view, you know, and uh, I would like it to be as interactive as possible, I don't have a presentation on everything. Uh, first I will start with a little, I mean, our story and uh, in the story, I'll try to highlight some points that I think could be of any importance or meaning to you guys. But please uh, feel free to stop me anytime you want to and ask me whatever, else, whatever you might want to. Alright? So let's begin. You know, I was, uh, I've had a very interesting life and uh, I didn't realize it till I, till a few years ago. I was born in a village. My parents, uh, they literally they lived in a village. But uh, they sent me to a boarding school very early in life. And when I say early, I'm talking of at the age of five and a half. So that's, that's the kind of thing. So I, in a way, I grew, I grew up outside the village, but uh, my home was in the village and uh, it was it was interesting now that I look back that I grew up hating my home I mean the place that I called home I grew up like absolutely hating just didn't, nothing made sense to me I mean whenever I went home everything seemed just uh, weird and uh, little things I'm talking about I mean you know, every single thing in a village costs you a little bit more. You know, a cake of soap will cost you a rupee more. It may be, it will probably be the worst quality possible. And, uh, of course, people are very lethargic. People, I mean, even though I work in the village, I have that social bend of mind as a lot, as you put it. Uh, I personally think village people are not the best of people out there. I still believe. For whatever reason. And general, I mean, you know, I would, every time I, I still remember so well, I would come home like during vacations and all. I mean, I was one of those kids that would try to find a reason of not going home. Literally, I mean, you know, and we had just one vacation every year. It was the winter vacation and it was a long two, two 
two two and a half month vacation, and so I would I would try to find every reason I could so that I could stay away from home. But you know, I mean, it was home, so I have to stay there. And the moment I would enter, I would I could feel this depression all around. It just wasn't a likely thing for me, and uh, so that's that's my earliest recollection of how it would go. Out, out. There is a little story that I tell everybody, I mean, and especially people who ask me, you know, why are you electrifying the villages? So, at my home in the village, there was a, there was a little school, a primary school. And the headmaster of that school, he was a Brahmin who was from a different place. So he stayed at our household, so he stayed at our home and he did his duties at the school and in the evenings he would just sit the kids down, you know, in the household and basically kind of just try to teach them. And uh, I remember it so well, his name was Dubeji. So, you know, in the evenings, I mean, all you have is a lantern, you know, sitting in the center and about five, six kids around it and then you have Dubeji sitting at one end and we would write our things and whatever, you would give us math to do. Kids, we knew one thing that Dubeji, his eyesight was not very good. So we would write the smallest we could. <laughs> like literally, I mean we would write the smallest letters we could so that whenever he took it, when he took our notebooks or slates, whatever the case be. I mean, he had such a difficulty like seeing. He was not a blind person, he was normally alright, but you can imagine like in the night, just a lantern and, you know, so he couldn't see much. And so, basically, he would just start telling stories. You know, I mean, my or whatever. Because he couldn't teach really, practically. And even though, I mean, I was a party, I conspired in, you know, <laughs> in love fulfilling his uh, immediate duties in those days, but uh, I, I felt, I could feel it, that the guy was very sincere. I mean, he didn't want to cut corners, he really wanted to teach. And even his stories and all, he would try to make them, you know, I mean, he would try to impart some lesson or the other, but again, it was not the same thing. So that, that little thing kind of still resonates in my mind a lot. That how not having simple, basic, you know, amenities in your life, how they could affect the person in you. I mean, a fairly honest and uh, respectful person, how he could be forced to literally cut corners just because the environment around him or her is not supportive, you know. So that, that, that was a serious one. So I knew all my life that I had to do something about it. I had to do, I mean, this, this is one thing that I knew that, uh, you know, no matter, I mean, the worse I feel, the felt, I mean, it was a catch-22 kind of situation that uh, I would feel that it's so bad, it sucks. And then I would feel that, okay, it sucks, I would know that it sucks because nobody does anything about it. And then I would be like, what am I doing about it? And so, you know, it was a circle, and uh, since it sucked so bad in my mind, I was definitely not thinking of going back and living there. So, you know, it was a vicious uh, circle, basically, and, uh, well, one thing led to another, and uh, I ended up, uh, you know, becoming an engineer, and uh, I went to New York to do my master's, then I was doing PhD. And I was pursuing my PhD around that time I had to come home for my sister's wedding. And uh, it was just one of those evenings, I mean, I was just sitting with a few people around me and, uh, you know, and people as usual, I mean, they were asking me about stories of, you know, America and all that and everything, how it happens there, what goes on and all. And, uh, and I, 
naively, like I just ended up saying, I threw a sentence that was something like, you know, I mean, it's hard to tell to you guys. It can't even be in your dreams. I mean, you can't even dream of the way it is. And I didn't mean to offend anybody, but an old guy there in the group, somehow he got a little offended by it. I and mean, he was like, yeah, I mean, for us it will always be a dream because, you know, people like you, you are going to always maintain a distance from us. So it will always be a dream. And I don't know what he exactly meant or what he was trying to convey, but that kind of, that, that had, that resonated somehow somewhere with me. And uh, that was, I believe, that the year was 2001. So in 2002, basically, and since then I, I was like, I got a little bit more into, okay, what can, what, how can I contribute? That was the simple idea, how can I do something about In 2002, I partnered up with the, my best friend from childhood, who was living in Patna, in Bihar those days. So I started, we started talking essentially, and I was like, let's do something in the rural space. Uh, well, our first two ideas were, since, you know, we come from North Bihar, so flood is a serious problem, and so the idea was, okay, either let's, if we can do something about flood control, that would be a good thing, and the second was electrification. Since I was, I'm an electrical engineer, and I was in the power management industry, working in that industry, so we were like, okay, let's figure out, uh, a way to do rural electrification. Now, as I said, I have no formal business education. Nobody in my family was a businessman per se. I mean, my father had a construction company, but he is more of a run of the mill contractor, which is not quite business. You take government contracts, you know, and you make some money. So, but, and, but I, I knew very well how much people would pay for electricity. So that, that bit I knew pretty well. And just from that bit, I was able to calculate, do that calculation, that okay, if we have, you know, a technology or a thing that could be put in place in X amount of money, it will be a sustainable thing. And the idea of sustainability, I mean, of course, was there that you know you don't want to do charity, you want to do some sustainable intervention. A big mistake I made at that point. I automatically assume that uh, it's something that's not being done because the technology for doing it doesn't exist. So I started with I started playing with new technologies. And by new technologies, I mean the technical people in the room, you might know of polymer solar cells. That's what I started. They are a different kind of idea of solar cells where you are not making cells on silicon and all. You just, they are special polymers that you could spin coat or you could spray coat and they could become your solar cells essentially. Started with that. For two years, me, a friend of mine had just recently finished his uh, PhD and he had worked on quantum dots, which are kind of related in a small way. And uh, he went on to become assistant professor at Iowa State. And so we, we worked uh, together and we thought that, you know, we would be able to edit some calculations that if the efficiency came to three and a half percent, we will be able to use it. The big idea was that we will coat all the roofs with the polymers and uh, you know create electricity that way. It was easier said than easier thought than you know it happened. I mean, in practice, when we started, the um, reported efficiency was one and a half percent, and the best we could do was probably 1.75, close to 2%. We couldn't do better than that. Two years and I was like, oh, whatever, this, this thing is never going to work out. This was 
then I spent some time trying to, then I had a lot of confidence in fuel cells, that that technology could have some answer, you know what I mean? So I spent some time on that, with time I'm talking of money as well, and uh, good amount of money. Then uh, that, that didn't seem going anywhere, then it was like, let's try some geothermal. You know, see back LTR effects and all this. Uh, spend some time on geothermal. And again, I'm talking of money. I mean, these are little things. If you try to do them in America especially, things cost money. I mean, everything. So, and I have no idea why I was doing it. I had no advisors, nobody to discuss with. I was just trying one thing after another. Whatever seemed cool to me. I was like, all right, let's, let's give it a shot. Let's see if it works out. That didn't work out either. Then we went for, that was uh, somewhere in between around 2004. We did 2003, 4, 2001 is when white LEDs came out. And uh, around 2003, 4, we tried productizing solar PV, where, you know, solar lanterns and all that. But then my partner Ratna, she shot it down saying it's not electricity. We want to do electrification. We don't want to get people lanterns. So that was uh, wind. Then was the idea on wind. In 2004-2005 time frame, a serious problem with wind was that if you wanted to buy a wind turbine, a single wind turbine, you couldn't buy it. Anybody who made wind turbines, they would do only turnkey projects. So Suzlon or anybody, I mean anywhere in the world, nobody was selling standalone turbines. And that was a serious problem. And then, you know, trying to characterize wind at a location, I mean that in itself is a year-long, minimum year-long process. So that was in a, we spent some, then a little bit while working on wind, using the same idea, a little bit on micro hydro, using, you know, canals and all, I mean, yeah, that, that was removed as well. Then we were working on biodiesel, 2000, end of 2005 is when we started working on Jetropa, it was a big, you know, I mean, there was so much, thoughts on Jatropa, you know, and uh, everybody thought it was very promising. And in, in fact, the trigger was in 2005, late 2005, in Los Angeles they launched these taxis that ran on biodiesel. So I was like, oh wow, so this thing does have potential. So we started on that, talked to a lot of people, and for the biodiesel, I thought that, okay, this seems looks like there is potential in it. I had never modeled the business or anything before that, but that, that time I thought, all right, that we should do some Excel work as well before, you know, in doing it. So I created uh, my first financial model, whatever you call it, I don't know what it was, but it was this very comprehensive big Excel sheet and tried to put in all the numbers and all, talking to people from you know, on phone and all, it was easy to get access to researchers, government bodies and all, you know, you say you're calling from Los Angeles, people talk to you, I mean, fairly easy in India. So, put in all the numbers and everything, and everything seemed so rosy and so good, I mean, I was like, alright, this is it. So, the big plan was that, you know, let's uh, try to find some piece of land and uh, we'll uh, grow some jatropa on it. The jatropa that will grow on that piece of land, we will use it to electrify, you know, whatever one to village. And then the village that we electrify, we will grow jatropa around the fields in that village and then that jatropa will be used to electrify the other two villages, excuse me, and uh, whatever. So not, not, not a very concrete model, but at that time it seemed that it would work somehow. And my personal plans were still never, I mean I never thought I'm coming back. My big time, my big plan was 
that okay, we will get it going. My friend Ratnesh will do it on the ground. I will try to arrange, I will arrange some money and all, and then I will go to Brazil and I will teach math and play guitar. That was the big plan. <laughs> like literally, that was. And this I'm talking of 2006. And so we we started. Uh, we found some land. We didn't find land. Normal land. So we took some land deep in next light area in the <coughs> Bihar, Jammu area, there's a certain We're like, all right, we'll talk to the next slides, you know, they'll agree. And uh, so we did all this, we arranged for seeds, we grew some saplings and just a lot of, you know, I mean, spent a whole bunch of money in that. Towards the end of 2006, one thing led to another and I I, I ended up going for a Vipassana course. I don't know if you guys know about Vipassana. But in one line, that's the meditation technique that Buddha used for his enlightenment. Which is an interesting some way. And uh, so I went for that. It's a 10 day course where you just meditate, you don't talk, you don't do anything, you don't run, you don't read, you don't watch TV, you don't do anything. Literally, you just meditate and you just survive. I couldn't survive 10 days, I left, I think, after 8 days. But uh, that, that sort of changed something. I mean, within a month, I was all packed up and back to Bihar, you know, without exactly knowing what I'm going to be doing. We, we had the Jatropa thing going on, but, uh, you know, I had never planned for my role on the ground. Once I got on the ground, and uh, so the first thing I decided to do was just take a tour around different places in India. So I went on this uh, month and a half, about two months long tour, going to all these places that people that I had talked to over phone, I wanted to meet, I wanted to see things and all, and just see what's going on mainly in the field of Jatropa and also in the field of other renewable technologies. And that those two months were, I have never had bigger shocks before, if I may put it like that. Every single thing, literally every single number, that I have been told on phone by so-called experts was bullshit. <laughs> Plain bullshit. Every single number, and I'm not kidding, every single, not a single number was right. Everything, and I'm talking you, to you, and it's not just the words that I believe, also the papers that people have published, also the reports that people have published. Everything, I mean, I mean, Every possible way that a number could have been validated without actually validating the number, I had done that. And I realized that it was complete bullshit. 100% bullshit, not a single. And I was badly depressed. By that time, we had already invested close to about one and a half crore rupees in that. And uh, and then I find out that, uh, okay, everything is baloney. You go change the numbers in your, in the Excel file. And the picture was just too terrible for us to even continue with it. So we shelved the project. Okay, whatever, just stop. And we were about to spend another few lakhs in it. And so, we, we stopped before that. And then I was depressed. I didn't know what to do. More so because I was back on the ground and I have no clue what could be done. So I started teaching uh, at the local engineering college, NIT Patna. And uh, still, somehow, there was something in me that I was in a sort of denial mode, if I could say. And I don't have reasons to explain. I mean, I can't explain why I was in that. But somehow, I couldn't accept the fact 
And okay, there was your dream of electrifying villages. Because after that point, we have nothing. I continued living as if we are working on electrifying villages. For no reason at all, we have no technology, nothing, no ideas. And last bits of money, I mean my 401k, that is retirement fund, provident fund, I, all I had was just that and my friend Ratnesh had last bits of his family fortune. So that's all we had, I mean fairly small amount of money. And uh, I still kept thinking that we are doing it. I have no idea how we are doing it, what we are doing. And so in that same this thing vein, I just once uh, asked a journalist uh, to get me in touch with some, you know, minister level guy so that I could understand what's the legislative take on, you know, electrification and all that. And uh, when I look back, I still don't know why I asked for that. And the guy got me, got me a meeting with uh, Sushil Modi, who was deputy chief minister. And then Sushil Modi, of course, you are NRI those days, they call me. So, you know, you get an audience, I mean. Talk to Sushil Modi and the guy goes, this is 2007, I believe, April, May, kind of, April, I believe, late April. He says, ye tum humare radar pe hai. Rural electrification is not even on our radar. <laughs> and that, that's all he said. He is like, I don't know. I will have to find out myself. Why don't we do one thing? We have a renewable energy development agency. <coughs> Why don't you go and talk to those guys there? I will uh, get you a meeting. So he called up whoever he called up and then somebody got me an appointment. <coughs> Excuse me. With a with the director there. <coughs> So I went to the Bihar oh, Energy Development Agency. Once there, the guy asked me, how are you going to do it? I have no clue. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know, I will just do something. And uh, whatever went to his mind and he just, you know, just hit his father, his P1 came and he's like, Oh, this guy who had just left the room, can you, can you call him? Some guy. And so he called this guy. And he is like, talk to him, he sells scarcity facts. You know, why don't you use something like that? And so the guy was actually, he was a dealer in gassy facts. And so he is like, oh yeah, 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 you could use gassy facts and everything. And I was like, wow. Yeah, I have known about biomass gasification, but I always thought this was something they did during the Second World War. It was a technology developed by Hitler for the war time. And that uh, there are a lot of issues with it and everything and people don't use it anymore. And then the guy tells me that there are, you know, there is about 40 gasifiers being used in Bihar today. And I was like, wow, I didn't even know. And uh, so then he tells me about the costing and everything, this, that, and, and then he, he saw uh, NRI basically, and he's like, all right, I can do some sales here, you know. <laughs> and he started talking of, we will do this 200 uh, uh, gasifiers, we will create a package for you, and this and that, and whatever. I mean, he started giving me that. But uh, I got thinking, and then he told me that those gasifiers, they were running, on rice husk, of course, but and they were using about 40% diesel and 60% uh, gas in what they call dual fuel mode. <clears throat> so they were using it <clears throat> that way. And uh, I was like, okay. So I talked to him, I heard whatever he had to say, I took his information, I came back. Once at home, I did my math and realized that 40% oh, diesel is nothing, it will kill. It, it will still not, the model will still not work out. I mean, it would still be very expensive. I wasn't concerned about <clears throat> it being clean, unclean, nothing. That wasn't even a thought, to tell you the fact. I mean, that was 
not even a consideration in my mind that it has to be a renewable technology or this. I knew it for sure that it has to be a non-conventional technology because the conventional technologies had not delivered. And I knew all these things that it has to be a distributed system and all that. That part was clear. But I never cared as much about if it, it was polluting the environment or not. I mean, so that didn't work out. But then I started thinking that if it can use, you know, I mean, 60% gas, a very naive thought. I wasn't even being an engineer there. I was just, just a simple thought. Why can't we use 100%? You know, why can't we just use the gas? If you can use 60%, that means the gas burns. Right? So if you have a combustible gas, why can't you use 100% of that gas? To make it work. Started Googling, started, started with Google. First came a paper from IASC. Then there were some other literature and all. And it said that uh, the tar content and all that, this, that is very high and all. So, using amorphous fuels like rice husk and all, you cannot run an engine only on the producer gas. The gas that is produced is called producer gas. On producer gas based uh, system. Just briefly I will tell you, for those who are not aware, some of you might be, Gasification is where you burn a biomass in controlled way. I mean, you burn it in a way that you get a certain mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen, and that mixture is combustible. And if it is combustible, it becomes pure. So, because of tar and all, they thought that is not workable. Then I talked to a few other people, and uh, Everybody said, oh, no, 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 don't be, don't be an idealist. People have tried a lot, like people have wasted a lot of time, money and everything. There was this 18 crore project in IIT Delhi just to prove that rice was, could be gasified, I mean, and used in 100% more with an engine. And there was this project here, there, whatever. And so I couldn't find a single instance where anybody would say that, no, it will work and it has worked and it works. In fact, a certain professor, I mean, I wouldn't name him. <laughs> I, I talked to him and uh, he wasn't even ready to like discuss anything with me. Like, I don't know where you guys come from, every two months I get some nutcase. Who wants to, to literally have it? <laughs> don't, don't go on me and think of me and all. Because I asked him, like, why can't it be used? No, no. Because I saw his paper or something. And he, he, <coughs> Much later, he once accused me of being a fraud, big fraud. That you were just bullshitting to the world that you've got a working system. But anyways, I mean, I, I can see where he was coming from. So, nobody, everybody thought that it's a very, very, very nutty idea. It's stupid to even think of trying that. People have tried it a lot. To tell you the fact, I have no idea why, I have no experience in gasification, maybe because of my experience in the tropa, I just knew that all these idiots are bullshitters. Somehow, I mean, I have no reason why, I have nothing but, I just knew that oh, this is just too flimsy a reason. I, I have never tried anything, I have never, by that time I have just seen a gasifier a couple of times. That's it. You know, I knew that people are using it here. So I just gone and seen how it works and all. I didn't even know the physics of it too well. And but I somehow thought that these guys are just bullshitting and it will work. Fortunately, I found a scientist from MNRE. He happened to share my thoughts. He thought he said, yeah, all these are bullshitting. <laughs> it will work. Later he told me that he just saw a an Alhadi and he thought the guy had some money that he gave it a shot. He confessed later, but <coughs> excuse me. But at that time he was like it will work. 
And so then we, then I went on trying to find somebody who was willing to make an engine for us. Nobody agreed. So finally, S. K. Singh, the scientist, particular scientist from MNRD, he helped us, me, with a, a small engine maker in Nagra. And then we got another small guy, a workshop he had to make gasifier. And I'm talking of this word June. Well, we started looking at gasifier. And by August 15, 2007, we had a working system. We had electrified our first village. And when I look back, I mean, few very important and very interesting takeaways for me from that experience was, if you want to make things happen, if you really want to make things happen, don't just don't listen to people. If you are anybody who is not the doer, anybody who is not the doer doesn't know shit. That's how I put it simply. It could be a researcher, it could be a policy maker, it could be an investor, it could be a financier. None of these guys know anything. If it's somebody who has not done it himself, and that is one even in the gasifier team, all the while I kept looking for one guy who had really tried it and failed. I couldn't find that either. I could find a lot of researchers who had tried it and failed. But not one guy who had put in his money and who had really slogged over it and then failed. Second, in fact, first, big, this one would be second, first big one was you need very simple or rather small elements to be able to do big things. Big elements don't do big things. All that madness about trying, you know, organic solar cells and fuel cells and geothermal and God knows what. It was totally stupid, so stupid of me, I mean, to be even thinking of those. And it was validated. You guys know of who knows of Bloombox? You guys know Bloombox, right? When Bloombox came out, it was validated. Bloombox is a very cheap fuel cell based technology. Very cheap, fairly, very cheap, cheapest product we out there in the ring levels. But, is it electrifying villages? It's electrifying Google headquarters at some million dollars something. And that was one bit that I had just not understood earlier when I was tinkering with all these new things. That whenever new things come out in technology or even model wise and all, totally new things come out. The tendency is always to skim the cream. Nobody thinks of scale, nobody thinks of volume, nobody thinks of numbers. People think of just that bottom line. Everything else in the middle doesn't matter. If you can put your technology in just one building and make few million dollars, why would you go on to put it at 5,000 villages and then make less than that? It just doesn't work out in the normal scheme of things. So the very idea to look for all these big and new challenges it was that I mean big and new technologies to you know to be able to do something like rural electrification that was totally stupid I should have probably started with very basic things ways to convert mechanical power into electricity I mean as in physical body animal and people's power or ways to convert every residue into electricity, then I wouldn't have had to wait for five years and I wouldn't have had to waste a lot of money. But that, that was, I guess you have to go through that curve before you arrive at the place. But these were very interesting learnings. I mean, even today when I look back, I mean, they just stand out. So after we had working systems, we put out two systems two 
you know, village and India was about those two into five villages. So we put two out. We had a good idea of you know, what should be the pricing and all, what will people accept. We started from very low price and worked out the pricing model and uh, somehow, you know, put a model together and everything. And then I knew we were out of money by that thing. That what do you do now after this? So, went to this friend of mine, he was my friend, uh, in undergrads in engineering, he was a student like you guys are here. He was at Darden Business School in you know University of Virginia, Manoj. So we made a video, nice little video. We made a presentation and all, sent it all to Manoj with a clear instruction. I don't mean to be racist, I don't mean to be offensive, but my instruction was get yourself a white guy, go present it out in business plan competitions and get us some money. You guys get 50% of the company. If we get, if you are able to bring some money, you get 50% of the company. Those guys did it. They went, they developed a big plan. You know, the kind of plan that business plan people would like to see. And uh, we had amazing success. Very interesting learning there was two guys who had never seen a system, never touched a system, <laughs> were able to win more than $500,000 in business plan competitions. That's the power of presentation. <laughs> now that is the power of presentation. And I know it for sure that it was more than just the idea. I mean the way they created a whole plan around it, I could have never. I could have never done that. I mean, just taking one little success that was, I mean, that was, if anything, just just a tiny technological this thing. I mean, not even a breakthrough per se. It's a small, very small success at the technological front. Being able to take it and, you know, I mean, Give it a shape that you can create your launching pad. That's to me like literally that's the power of presentation. And I always thought business schools are full of shit. And that was the time when I realized that no, that's 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 what you learn. <laughs> Don't change the hypothesis. <laughs> I'm sorry, I mean I could be wrong. I think not an authority or not. Say, Don't change the hypothesis. Oh, okay. <laughs> Coming from a professor in a business school. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, that, that's when I started appreciating, you know, what's taught and what happens in these uh, schools. That, you know, and to, I mean, I was surprised more than anybody else. Yeah. <laughs> this thing really like, you know, and the citations were like amazing, the greatest new idea to change the world. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, all right. <laughs> the fast company in magazine in 2008, they called us social entrepreneurs of the year. Like, what? <laughs> That's when I realized I'm an entrepreneur now. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I didn't know. I didn't even understand what EBITDA, believe it or not. I understood EBITDA, like the full form of EBITDA in 2009. <laughs> I, I have no clue at all, I mean all these, you know, jargons and I had no idea even what entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship, I knew nothing for any of it. And uh, <laughs> then I saw the past company back then and I was like, wow. So that, that, that was very interesting learning as well. That was a very, very, very interesting learning. That 
you know, presentation matters. And uh, in fact, after that, there is not much of a story. Uh, but uh, after that, things just fell in place. And it's amazing, it's so true. What you do on the ground is all good, but it's the perception. Lot of journalists, lot and lot of journalists in Bihar, because I happen to have some family who are some senior people with some of these types of India, any TV and all. So I knew a lot of journalists in Bihar. All of those journalists knew that we have done two things like this. The new box. Nobody cared. We got in New York Times in 2008 and then suddenly everybody wanted to know everything about us. And that was another very interesting realization. That nobody cares how they see what they see. Everybody cares and I was able to kind of extrapolate it not just to journalists but to other people as well. Everybody, people don't get impressed by what they see as much as they get impressed by what others see. And I was like, wow, that's, that's something. I mean, to that extent, everybody in my family, everybody thought I'm a nutcase. People thought that I had married somebody and she left me. So I'm just, uh, I'm, you know, I'm in the shock, so I'll come back home. And I'm just doing all this. Stupidity is trying to create belief from so I'm not that. <laughs> no, that's how it was. And then they were all very excited as well, suddenly. Everybody was proud of me. <laughs> Everybody was proud of me, like literally, and I was like, wow. I mean, on the ground it was the same, nothing had changed. I was Still doing the same thing, but then you know, I mean, the government, MNRE knew about us from day one. It was them and, and MNRE, MNRE, you know, scientists who had helped us, if anything. I mean, nobody really, everybody thought we were not cases. I mean, SK Singh was the only one who gave any support. So MNRE knew about us totally well. But once we started coming, like there was this period of late 2008 and all, there was a period of about two weeks or something, and we were in all kind of newspapers. I believe that time we had won the DFJ Cisco business plan competition that comes with $250,000 in investment. So they were like, oh, eight crore ka prize will I and all. So there was like everywhere, then suddenly MNRE secretary is calling. You know, and it just changes everything. And the secretary and all, oh, this is such a great thing. And all, oh, how can we be a part of it? That was a sentence. And I'm like, all right. I'm like, the best you can do is stay out of our way. <laughs> and I mean, again, that was my arrogance as well. But I didn't know. I mean, you take somebody from here and put it there. So arrogance is bound to creep in. But uh, that, 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 that was uh, the change and uh, <coughs> to tell you the fact, after that, it's never been as exciting. That was a peak of excitement for me <laughs> because that was the time and I don't think it will ever be that exciting because till that time I myself didn't believe in what we were doing. So the whole line about, you know, you are more impressed by how others see something rather than how you see that thing. That, I mean, that stood true just even for me. I myself didn't know. I had like no visions that, okay, we will do this many numbers, that, you know. I just wanted a way to electrify the rural areas and the, I guess the reason was simple that I had been complexed about that for so long in life. And when all these things started happening, that's when I, basically, my ambition or my, that's when I sort of, that was my transformation, so as to say, into an entrepreneur. 
Till then, I was just, I wasn't even thinking what I want to do. I was just, I want to electrify villages. That's all. That was there. How, why, how many, I had no answers, none of that. I, I never even thought of it. None of those questions. It was only after that that I started thinking that, oh, okay, now this thing does seem to have some merit and uh, we could possibly do a lot of things. And so after that, you know, came investors, in fact, before investors came some grant makers, we got some grants and uh, I mean, once we had that, and what was funny was, so people would come, for example, Shell Foundation first came. <coughs> And they would talk of, so how fast can you set up many of these? I don't know, I mean, we can set up a couple every week. What's the big deal? Oh no, you gotta be kidding me, how could you do that? And I fail to understand what are these guys talking about. I mean, if I can set up one, I can set up ten, what's the big deal? Right? So they were like, okay, oh, you take this much money and you put like this much, you know, three plants in two months and uh, then show them. And we're like, all right, put three plants in two months. Take a little more. Put five plants in two months. All right, five plants in two months. And then, man, everybody got really pumped up and wow. You know, uh, this, is, this is something, uh, crazy speed and everything, how fast, you know, I mean, you have the whole feasibility, scalability and sustainability and all that and <laughs> then people then people started asking me so how will you make it sustainable, what if this happens, what if that happens and somehow all those were the easiest things for me I mean I was never bothered about those people oh what if the government uh, grid comes in there I'm like alright our electricity will be for free then. oh how will it be for free oh this is uh, there is char, we will make this with char, we will do product char, maybe we will do this, we will do that. And that's when I realized that all of this was so easy for me because I was not trying, and I realize it in fact now more, because I was not trying to set up an electrification business. I was not trying to set up a business. All my life I had been so complex about the rural society. I mean, I have, I still have, if somebody asks me, I'll have 10 different ideas on what could be done. Just like that, without having to think about it. So things like we have, I wouldn't go into details of those, product channeling and all using the distribution, you know, network of that. They came naturally. Because before this, I had funded somebody while I was still in the US, a cousin of mine, I had funded him 2-3 lakh rupees worth, excuse me, to start a business like that, product channel, where you have, you know, a lot of these small shops in the villages and all, and they don't have any supply chain system and whatever, and so I had funded them to do it like that. So when people ask me, how will you make it sustainable and what if this happens, what if that happens? It was not, it was a no-brainer for me to just, oh, okay, we will do this as well. Just plug that in. And if I had kind of taken it as, oh, okay, I'm going into this business, doing this, and we have to create padding, you know, then maybe it wouldn't have been that simple. So, that was, that is another interesting, interesting learning, I mean, from my own experience, that, the business of doing business becomes much harder if you do it as business. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, that, that, that's what I see, I mean, so, and uh, it's very clear, even today, I, it's very hard for me to think in terms of a business now. Like, we are in the process of raising a round of financing. So, you know, all these crazy financial models and this, 10 kilo, 10 megabyte file, that's our financial model, I'm like, oh, I mean, I don't even have the, I mean, I, I can't even go through it, all of it, I, I don't even want to go through all of it. People talk to me about valuation, how much do you want this, that, I'm like, I don't know how much I want. I think about it very differently. 
I don't think in terms of how much I want, how much I don't want, and what's the exact number. Do I want my company to be valued at 50 million or do I want it to be valued at 20 million? I don't care about any of that. I, I look at it in a more commonsensical way. Okay, there are one or there are three ingredients of a company. Four ingredients. One is consumers, they are benefiting anyways. Then you have the promoters, people who took the plunge. You have people, employees, people who are really working at it, and you have investors, people who are throwing money. So all I care about is equitable distribution of the company. Company is nothing but a basically a gold mine, if you will, or whatever mine we are, we are creating. So any benefits that come out of it have to be distributed equitably in all these three groups. And of course, my own, I have my own definition of what's equitable is now. <laughs> I wouldn't go into that. <laughs> but but that, that's how I look at that exercise. And people sometimes have a little hard time dealing with me in that way, but that's the best I can do. I can never think in terms of numbers, like, oh, okay, after this many years, my total revenue is going to be this much, so you do this multiple, this discounted cash flow, and whatever, to me, that's too complicated. Because I know it very well that, A, you cannot model my business. If you are trying to model my business, you are being very stupid. The best you can do is model your own expectations. Second, I don't know myself where my business is going to go. I have no clue at all. I mean the numbers that I am throwing at you are either very conservative Depending on where I am throwing those, if I am throwing those at certain platforms, I will make them very conservative so that I never fail, so that, you know, I mean, I can come back a year later and say I am alright. Or if I am at other platform, I will just throw some huge aspirational number that I still don't have a clear cut vision of. I will just throw it because you want to hear a big number. I will just say that we want to electrify 5% of electricity starving people in the world. Whatever that means. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, so it's, it's very hard to put, capture these things in numbers. And, well, I, I, I have yet to develop a good learning on this, but I guess my learning is going to be that numbers are important. I hope it's not, but uh, so that's 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 kind of a little bit of the story bit. I I don't want to bore you guys too much with my monologue. And uh, again, I mean, there's a lot of nitty gritty. It's a complex organization. Somehow we've been able to pull it through. Just to give you where we are right now. Right now we are electrifying about 450, close to 500, in fact, more than 450 villages and hamlets. Uh, right now, we are, we have about 500 people as well in our team. Uh, right now, we have, uh, what, what else is a good number to show up to guys? I don't know anything else Revenue. you want. I mean, I like it. Uh, Revenue. Don't, don't ask for <laughs> 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 mean, uh, we, are, we are not uh, very good, I mean, but uh, still around uh, around 50 lakh a month kind of number. But again, revenue in our case doesn't mean much at this point because right now we are at, we are, I mean, so we have these three different models. And again, <laughs> this is a funny story how I came up with these models. So then investors and everybody started talking about in future how are you going to go and all this. And earlier I used to talk about we want to grow as an ecosystem, this, that, whatever. I would try to be as technical in my own ways. But people wanted very clear cut, you know, what what are your models for growth and everything. So just one fine day I came up with this. We will have boom, bomb and beep. <laughs> so, Boom is built, owned, operated, and maintained by us power systems. So that's plants where we set the plants up. <coughs> and uh, 
we basically lay out lines and everything. We provide electricity. We <coughs> we arrange for the feedstock. We do the collections. Second is BOM. That's built, owned, and maintained by us power systems. And uh, in that, we get a local entrepreneur, which is in about 10% of the project cost. And we entirely sell for ourselves. But everything else is kind of similar. And then at some point, some investor arranged for some funds from somewhere and uh, said, Why don't you guys get your everything analyzed and all? So we got a consultant uh, to kind of come look at our books and everything. and suggest what kind of plans work, what doesn't work and everything and the, the consultant I mean, they did a good job at it and then they suggested oh why you, why are you staying at PM? Deconstruct your PM so our PM is deconstructed which is I mean I, I just find it amusing because you know people like to have a separate phrase, a separate name and all. But essentially BM means the company doesn't fully own the plant and the company doesn't fully operate them. As in the company could still have, the operator could still be a husk power employee or husk power could still have the same 30% stake in that particular operation but it, it's all just to ensure that we are able to capture people with all kind of different, you know, I mean, different expectations and different uh, resources on their hands. So we we are at the point our in the future we see mainly BM plants. So we already migrated from whom to BOM. And from B, BOM was mainly done to present the case to the bankers. That I knew very well that you know the bankers are bad people. They don't want to give money to small people. No, I mean that's a, such a shameful thing that in India I mean you want a loan of 5 lakh rupees or 10 lakh rupees, there is hardly any money. You want 10 crore, there will be 10 people coming literally sitting in your office for 10 days. And so that's, so basically the idea was to, you know, have a bunch of plans that we can show to the bankers. And it kind of worked. I mean, the bankers at local level, they have agreed to fund our BM partners and also. So eventually it's mainly going to be BM. And that's why I said revenue doesn't matter much because these revenues are more of BO, boom and BOM. Going forward, once the plant sales revenue that starts coming in, which we are in the process of, then the numbers will automatically inflate. So, just to give you a perspective. Well, so, what's the total uh, coordination capacity? If you talk of total capacity, it will be around 4 megawatts. How much in each plant is? Where is 30 kVA, 40 kVA, 63 and a half kVA, 80 kVA? Based on the village size. Yeah, based on we are restrict. I mean, we do distribution in a radius of a kilometer to kilometer and a half. So depending on what's the load in that radius, the you know I mean the exact size of the plant varies. Please. The operations are primarily considered in Bihar. Yeah. You can go outside of Bihar. UP. But that's just next. And the pricing model, who pays the rest of Bihar? I was complimented by my partner once that, and you know, in our team we have some very exciting MBAs. I mean, some MBAs from America and all that and we've had people come and go, you know, some very interesting MBAs. And so Manoj once complimented me that, I guess you guys have taught how to pricing, right? I was in the thought pricing and every pricing in the company has been done solely by me. And uh, apparently I've been able to get the right numbers. My way of pricing again is I'm not, I don't look at how much it's costing me to make it? I'm looking at how much the other guy can afford. 
That's what it's supposed to be. I guess. Only if you get an accountant, he will take you backwards. backwards. Yeah. So I guess that's. So I, I look at how much he can pay and go that way. Now pay, you just get an idea of, you know, how much uh, kerosene they spend, you know, normally. Now again, in that, we have to contextualize. Let me give you this very interesting example. And so, you do, you go to, let's say you have to price power for a CFL for six hours in the evening, right? Now, the alternative they have is kerosene. The alternative they have is kerosene. Typically, you use about 100 ml. It goes 85, 90 to 100 ml of kerosene to light the lamp for about an hour. Depending on there are some better lanterns that will consume a little bit less and some crude dias, they will consume a little bit more. So you do the math and it comes to about you know 18 liter a month, right? To light one lamp for this thing. Now you go to your math out of 18 liters, 3 liter to a half liter, they get through you know EDS. So that's about 12 rupees, so that's 30 rupees. And then about 15 liter they are getting from black market, that's 30 rupees something, 450. So it's about 500 rupees. So you can go comfortably price it at 250. What's wrong with this logic? What's wrong? There is something very wrong with this logic. Single payment. Single payment. No, they don't use six hours of light when they have that. They use just an hour of light. They won't use six hours of light if they have to do that. So, that's why, I mean, you can't do math on these things. You can't believe in what they say. You have to go observe. Then you have to do your math. You see that what's an average they are using light for. Average people use only two hours of Villages. So you do your math accordingly. The two hours of light every day, you are talking of about six liter of kerosene, three, two and a half liter, thirty rupees there, other three and a half liter, that's about hundred rupees, hundred, hundred twenty rupees is what they are paying. We want to look cool, we want to save them money, so let's slash it in half. So 50 to 60 rupees becomes a reasonable price. So that, I, I hope that kind of answers. So one, where I was coming from is uh, something like, when you're talking about such large scale 40, 500 villages, right? Even in these villages and also in a single village, you don't have a similar ability to pay. Because you told me all this, mm -hmm. the way you price, not from a business point of view, but you consider the ability of the villages mm -hmm. to pay, right? Mm -hmm. Oh no, 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 then you are creating serious problems. Then your people know what's going on in the next village. You are creating serious problems. So we have a formula. We, there is a certain formula according to which the more you consume, the lesser you pay. That could be debated. I mean, I, I, I agree that it doesn't have to be that way. It could be the other way as well. But it has to be as per a formula. Otherwise, they will kill you. I mean, they will, <laughs> these things, are, you know, yeah, it has to be uniform. Otherwise, they will just not. They will, they will be, you will have rebellion, you know, in your customers. Please. Husk uh, uh, as a raw material. <coughs> Do you think there is a reason to look at, uh, you know, is that like, like what? Oh, by the way, I didn't uh, call, uh, clarify it. We don't just use husk, any activist. Husk, again, husk power systems is, you can look at it as, I didn't name it. I was doing everything on the banner of an NGO. The two business school guys did it. <laughs> God knows why they use husk, but it's a good name, I like the name. 
I mean, and in a way, it commemorates the first beat stock that got a success. Or it wouldn't, I mean, in the technical world also, people were rattled. People wouldn't have been rattled if it were something else. Because rice husk is what was considered the holy grail of, you know, the gasification community, that entire community. So, that way. But today, we are not going to use what are we used today? Uh, wheat husk, uh, even uh, paddy straw, mustard shell and straw, certain glasses, certain wild, you know, bhai and all. So, is that something which continues to keep on finding out what else can be used with that? Yeah. These things are more necessity is the mother of invention. So we do these things out of necessity. You know, rice husk still remains the most plentiful, you know, most abundantly available agri residue in the villages. But you know, as you as the need arises, you try different things. And we have a, developed a certain rule of thumb and all that. You know, we have a box. You fill it up. If it weighs a certain amount, that means it will be used. It's like that. Okay. First, I, I think I. No. No, how difficult is it to you know, copy the technology that you have, and how have you protected it? Basically, I'm asking how difficult is it for a new person to get into the business as a copy. Okay. Now everybody wants me to protect the technology, and I tell everybody, people who matter that way. You guys don't, so I can be true to you. Uh, I tell them we are in the process. We are not. I don't believe in protecting. I don't believe in protecting at all. I mean, to me, that would be a serious sin. And of course, I know in the business world, it's very hard to take personal stance. You know, I mean, that is not for Ganesh Pandey, it's for us power systems. But I personally don't believe in protecting anything like this. Uh, one way is, I mean, because I don't want to, I want people to copy. Another is, the innovations are such simple that in order to protect it, I will have to divulge it. I will have to release it. You see what I mean? I will have to, you know, so there are still some things that only I know. I'm not kidding. There are still some very simple things because others don't care about you know, I mean, some mechanics and all in our system, they see the same thing. But they don't know like that that is what makes it unique or that is what makes it this thing. For others to do it, if you do it through us, it's simple. Because that is what we have grown ourselves in. That production technology, a very expensive uh, training program, then uh, monitoring, metering, all these kind of MIS, everything we have developed. So if you do it through us, it's easy. Somebody else trying to do it, it's impossible. Because again, I mean, I, I'm trying to find a humble way of putting it, but apparently there doesn't seem to be any. <laughs> the fact is that every single thing that we use. We have to innovate ourselves. We don't have the luxury of getting things from the shelf. We don't. I mean, so that's a, that's what that's why I say if anybody tries to do it, yeah, they can do it, but they need to be in a case like us. <laughs> and they need to have their stars work out the way they did for us. Then they can make it happen. But it's it's going to be a tough one. I mean. You will have to, if you use us in any way, either directly as a business, or if you just copy every single thing we have, then you can do it. I mean, then you can definitely do it. But otherwise, it's, it's going to be very painful. I mean, you know, when we think of electrification, rural electrification and all, again, that is another learning that I had. I mean, I've had is production technology is just like 10-15% of the whole game. Production is nothing. I mean, electricity production is nothing. How to distribute it? How to manage it? I mean, <laughs> working, I mean, the biggest challenge, what, just, I would like you guys to take a shot. I, I'm hoping everybody gets it right. But what do you guys think would be our biggest challenge? Distribution. Distribution. 
Free tapping of electricity. One is the delivering of electricity, second is distributing the, uh, making sure that your operations run in an efficient way so that you can distribute it much to a much wider audience. Yeah, kind of, but nobody got it right. People are bloody thieves, 100% of them. Not just customers, every one of our employees. People, the worst of people, to the extent, believe it or not, without any management education, I'm like, we have to, the kind of level at which I have to work at is, I have to think of ways we can manage and I have to find our 3C and this relationship management, this, that. I mean, that becomes my job. I give our team, our team lectures on management. That's like the real, real, real challenge. The real challenge is that none of us initially realized, I didn't either, you guys wouldn't either, that what happens is, always in these kind of activities, you will have a person who is transitioning from what I call normal corporate spaces and all those structures, I call them evolved spaces you know, evolved professional spaces, right? So usually it will be somebody from an, from the evolved space making a transition in the evolving space. You know, so our kind of space is an evolving space. Invariably, either of the two happens. A, either you just get so damn frustrated because you are still expecting the soul the evolved space treatment to you and you start claiming nobody's professional, people don't do what they are supposed to do, this, that, whatever. Or B, you just reduce your efficiency drastically. You just take one little thing and you just start firefighting, doing everything yourself and you reduce your output drastically, either of the two happens. Because all of us, everybody that I saw and seen some good ones, everybody fails to understand that difference because it's a totally different platform we are talking about. And somehow change themselves in a way that they can fit in that platform. Some of the best people from the evolved spaces make the worst workers in the evolving space. Just for that reason. You could have the best of ideas, they don't mean anything. In a normal, decent company, if you have a good idea, chances are something will be done about it. You know, if you have somebody reporting to you, you tell them a thing that needs to be done, chances are something will be done about it. In that space, nothing. Why? Why? I personally feel that two motivators, oh, three motivators, but two motivators, I personally feel. One is fear for anybody. Another is greed is a bad word, a bad connotation, but if you remove the bad connotation of it, greed could be expectation, you know, your long term goal or whatever you call it. Lumping it all in that greed pit. Please don't take offense, I don't mean greed in a bad way. I mean, whatever be the right word for it. I personally feel it's only these two things that make people work. That either I will not have what I have, I will not this, or something that's out there, I have to go and get that. You know, I personally feel that uh, these two are the strongest. In the evolving space, these two are completely missing. Or these two have a totally different dimension. <coughs> the person who is just used to loitering around, he used to running to Punjab once, then Mumbai other time, somewhere else, you know, I mean, whatever he is, somebody who is okay with doing anything to feed his stomach, that's all he cares about. He doesn't think of a career. You may give him as many lectures as you want. You may give him as many examples as you want. You may give him whatever facilities you want. He doesn't understand it. And I'm talking in a generalized sense. There are some that do. And so he doesn't understand <coughs> career at all. 
as far as greed, he doesn't even know that there is something better out there that he could achieve. So he doesn't even understand that. So he doesn't have that kind of greed. His greed is very time temporary. He sees 100 rupees lying in front of him, he will just take it, pocket it. That's end of his greed. So he doesn't have the faculties to channelize his, you know, his aspirations, expectations or whatever. So, when you have this very fundamental thing completely missing, how do you manage? How do you get any work done? My poster boy, the guy that I used to present everywhere, that in two and a half years we took him from 2,500 to 25,000 rupees a month from a simple, you know, plant munchi to a plant to a regional manager managing 25 plants and all. The guy turned out to be the biggest thief. He did. He had stolen some like 5, 7 lakh rupees over a period of time. And that's the reality of that space. A big reason why we are not doing a lot of boom, trying to do more of BM and all, because these are the hard things that how many people, how many places can you manage? So, okay. One solution is you create owners at every plant. You know, so then you think of a different, you know, model slightly. Uh, usually, I mean, the way we go about it is we don't, I like to say, like, we don't go uninvited. So, A, somebody has to want to set up a plant there, or people have, in general, to want, want to. And then there is a questionnaire that essentially you are looking two things you care about. If you have enough seed stock, and if you have enough consumption. Now, it's up to you how many questions you can ask to get answers to these two questions. Everything else, you can never guess, till you really go. I mean, till you really set up a plan. Whether people will pay, whether people will not pay, that's very, these things are very hard to guess. Not anything, I mean, it's electricity, whatever they may need it for. Last I read about the company was for small traders in middle market places. They use it and they use it for studying in the life. Don't come, again, as I told you, don't believe in what you read. I mean, they're not lying per se, they won't. But it, it's very subjective. A reporter goes, he sees just these things happening. Irrigation is a very seasonal thing. And irrigation, you got to realize, you know, it's, there is a limitation to how far you could take your line. To. And so, you know, it will be limited around areas. We do. But it again depends place to place, plant to plant, season to season. It's electricity. So it can be used for whatever you want to use it for. We do irrigation as well, some places. We just use their poles in those cases. <laughs> <laughs> we don't use their infrastructure. Yeah, my question is, uh, how much of a political assistance or resistance you face in your uh, no, no, no. Politicians stay away. And uh, what help did you get from the government? Or are you getting any help from the government in doing what you want? Oh yeah, I mean the central government helped us. So, you know, I was telling you about when we said that the best the government could do is stay out of our way. Let me have pinched the secretary and uh, very, he let me like literally write the policy for that particular subsidy disbursement. I mean, in as little a term as I can say, like they got Ernst and Young to advise them and all. Basically, it was a young kid just out of some business school. <laughs> and uh, that kid had no clue what to suggest. And the secretary said,
सर फिर तुम भी पांडे जी के पास जाओ तो वहां से लिख के लेते आइए
but there are some small pockets, I mean a small hamlets that just are not feasible in our way. I mean you will have some 20 villages out just in a corner. So it's very hard to put our kind of a system. So for those locations you don't have a choice but to go for something like solar. So we are doing even those. And uh, I'm still hoping my organic solar cells will work out. <laughs> talked about theft. Do you face electricity <coughs> therapy? Probably would. Yeah. Now how do you handle this? And oh, I have a very good cure. That's a technical cure. We figured out. So we have a theft proof system now. And of course, theft was initially not a problem. When we had, you know, when I was, I mean, till a certain level, I was managing things on the ground myself to an extent. And then as it goes bigger, you know, you get kind of more and more disconnected. And then came some other very capable guys. But then even they, they have gotten a little disconnected and all that. So now it has started becoming a problem. So we, our solution for that is, oh, but then I'll be <laughs> telling you what it is. <laughs> I can tell you, it's alright. Uh, so we, our solution for that is basically you don't supply at 2.30. You supply it around 400 volt, phase to neutral, simple, single phase, so that they cannot tap. So first you want to do is, they shouldn't be able to take your electricity at their level. Right? So you supply it 400 volts, and then we have developed our prepaid meter. Inside the prepaid meter is where you put the step down transform. That makes electricity usable for them. And so they don't have a choice but to go through that device. Now, to a step down 400 volts from to 200 volts in single phase, you will never find a transformer. Even if you find a transformer, this will be very expensive. I mean, it's not usually available. You can have it custom made or from China and all, but it will be expensive. So, you know, it's not, so basically you cannot. And that is one way, another way you change the frequency that's slightly a little bit more expensive but we do, so the idea is you just make it not usable for them in normal way. It can be used only if they take it through your contraption and then your contraption has a meter built in it. So that's... Would you increase distribution last this thing? You know in the transformer one Slightly, but if you look at theft in account, take theft in account, it's a saving. Another thing is in the lines you are reducing the loss because 400 you have lesser loss. Please. Sorry. Why keep you going to EMS? You know, now I mean, today there is a lot that keeps me going. I mean, I mean, it's, 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 it's a. It's a very often asked question and I will be very true, I mean, uh, right now, today, I'm, the way I see it is this, I've got this wonderful, wonderful thing, you know, so I need to find something far more wonderful than this, to go to something else, and it's very hard to find something, what else could be more wonderful than what I have? So, very simple, I mean, I would be lying if I said that, oh, my heart is full of this desire to change the world and all, all that is good. But uh, tell you the fact, I mean, it's very simple. I mean, yeah, if you, a question, tough question would be what kept me going then? That I don't know. That I guess was just my past. I mean, I just wanted to do something, right? Because my biggest problem was I had everything in life, but I was just not at peace with myself. I felt something missing. So that was then and now it's easy. Now my sustainability is very easy. I think. Get to meet all the cool people, get to start. <laughs> so <that's>, uh, nothing, <laughs> nothing wrong with it. What's the biggest challenge you're facing now? Or there is nothing? No, that is people. How to manage people at that level? I still have yet to get a handle on that. I don't know if I'll ever get a handle on that. 
and and another thing is like most of the companies that you talk of or that you know of who are working in rural space let me tell you they stop like at least 30 kilometers before us what we do is unique so unique at so many levels not just from the point of view of it being you know I mean electricity and all that but also like the kind of penetration we get the kind of rural like real real rural you don't have anything microfinance so as to say does go but not quite I mean even microfinance guys don't go that deep and even when they go deep I mean they wouldn't go that deep as in setting an office and all that or a permanent establishment we have a permanent thing at all these places where you know the money that gets collected is kept and everything I mean so that's that's a serious challenge I mean how you deal with so you and you can't have people you know with better education with better quality outlook or whatever even though in my personal thing as far as people and uh, I personally believe that education and all that doesn't quite change as much. I mean, it stands true for each one of us, I believe. If we were in the same situation as those guys, we would do the same thing for us. So, we, we have yet to get, these days we are trying what, what I call relationship-based management. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's like, you know, if you have no fear, there's no, it's hard to put the grief back. You just develop a relationship. And so it's uh, the whole concept of three C's we talk about. Communication, consideration and caution. And so our management sutra is, we manage by building relationship with clear and respectful communication. Uh, <laughs> utmost consideration and extreme caution. For you, just being a local, did it help? Yeah, a lot. I mean, uh, drawing on on uh, a network of your family's or father's connections. In terms no, of, not, not in the government, but in the... My family. father thought I was... He has, my father is one guy who has still not bought into the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> so there was no question of drawing anything. I mean, he's alright. He, he helped me with some money every once in a while. But that's all he helped me with. Nothing else, he just totally, he, he was, his stand was very clear that what you are doing is totally absurd, bizarre and bound to fail. I don't want to be a part of it. Like all powers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but anyways, I mean, he, he, but he, he does take some pride in, you know, whatever. But uh, no. not as much of that, what helped, it was very interesting that, so when I first came, People would look at me and they would think I was a Firan. You know, I was a white guy. In those days, I was a little bit fairer, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, in the head shave and in a goatee and all, they're not used to this kind of look. So they would think I was, I'm an outsider, you know. So people would gather around me, literally. And then I would start speaking in Bhorpuri. And that's, that's the best way to connect. <coughs> That's the best way I've seen, like, you would see even today, and I, I, I've seen some examples, some, you know, foreigners and all Europeans or Americans. If an American suddenly starts speaking Hindi, he will suddenly connect with all the Jaiwalas, everybody, you just connect. And then it becomes very simple. So I guess that did work to my advantage. I didn't use any connection, any family, nothing. Not initially, I mean, later... A lot of kids from my village work in the company now, but not initially. My first uh, 25, first 20-25 employees well, was me, of course, we founders and all. Then I got another guy who was with me in school. He used to work in Florida and he, he came back. He saw me come back and he thought, yeah, okay, he wanted to do a rural sports league thing. So he came back, I tapped him to do accounts for us. And uh, so he was the only guy I mean, that I knew sort of from before. But everybody else was just people picked up on the ground. Are you 
planning to expand outside China? Yeah. Definitely. Everywhere, everywhere in the world, globally. We will have a discussion uh, if you want uh, over tea. And uh, thank you. Uh, <coughs> and I am Bangalore. Thanks for taking up the time from your degree schedule. Thanks a lot. I hope it made sense to you. I hope it helps you in some way or the other. I could uh, throw my email ID on the okay, if uh, somebody has.